Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my peers and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Zach Franzik. Zach is a tooling development manager at Siemens Energy. Zach, welcome to the pod. Oh, happy to be here. Uh, happy to have you here. Yeah, I've been wanting to do this for a while. I'm glad uh, glad you could come on. Yeah, it's good. It, it seems like it's a fun thing to do. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So how'd you get into uh, to the energy biz? Oh, so I, I graduated from the Merchant Marine Academy people say that and be like even my kids like oh so you were in the marines right like we've been over this several times <laughs> <laughs> like i was never in the marines it's different which so during just a quick segue into this during world war ii tons of merchant ships getting sunk by the germans and u-boats and we we had to ship everything overseas so how does that get done on merchant ships so the the government said we're gonna have a a program to graduate qualified officers to man these ships. And so that's where the Merchant Marine Academy came in. And that's what they do to this day. They train people to be ships officers so that in the time of major war, we've got enough qualified people that can operate cargo ships to send over our cargo. That's so, awesome. Yeah. So that it's, it's all under Department of Transportation, but it it's aligned with Naval Academy, Coast Guard Academy, it's, it, it, it functions like that. But the, there's nuances and differences. You still have to get congressional nomination to go and all that stuff. So graduating from that, uh, I had a, a degree in marine engineering. And the similarities between running a power plant on a ship and a power plant on land, it's all the same. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> same things <laughs> involved. Uh, so I got recruited to do field service engineering and for at the time it was Siemens Westinghouse. Siemens had bought Westinghouse and um, these two companies together made up a good market share of the installed power base in the US. And uh, then they dropped the, Se the Westinghouse, that it was just Siemens, now it's Siemens Energy. A lot of things have changed since then. So my first role was as a field service engineer where we would go and do power, um, we do the basically the maintenance at these power plants and my responsibility was to help take these things apart inspect them put them back together make sure they're going to run for the next i don't know 18 months to two years until the next maintenance cycle essentially so yeah so that's how i got into it and um still working in in the service side which has been pretty good awesome yeah Dumb question, but like, yeah. when do you typically take apart the uh, the reactor on a ship? Or I guess mm. it wouldn't be there; it would be the generator. <laughs> like you can't do so, it when you're at sea. I would assume. Right. <laughs> so reactors are only on naval vessels. So there was actually, interestingly enough, uh, during the '70s, where like nuclear was awesome and we're going to do everything nuclear. There was a, a U.S. nuclear merchant vessel called the Savannah. Oh, interesting. I didn't right. know about this. No. So it was like. <laughs> When I was in school, there I think there were some of our engineering buildings had, or one of them had a, a painting of it, right? I think it was actually in the library. It might still be there. But, you know, obviously, nuclear kind of went out of fashion for a while. Yeah. <laughs> now it's Around the Chernobyl coming. time. Well, in Three Mile <laughs> Island. And, and also, it's just, it works, but it's also really expensive. And uh, if you haven't seen, like, the, the, the numbers for the Vogel plant in Georgia, I think it was, like, $14 billion. For to build it or yeah so a brand new nuclear that's yeah, no joke how uh, much power does it put out i mean is it oh worth it's it? over like, a thousand you... megawatts but yeah okay. i mean someone's gonna pay for that over time now you have I mean, when do some... you ROI? i mean I, I guess maybe these are deep questions i i know I, I wouldn't i don't have the numbers in front of me fair enough but it, it's not it's not a 10 <laughs> year and it, i mean that's all regulated power too so i think for georgia power i think actually i think southern company owns that one um don't quote me on that. <laughs> I, I'm good. pretty sure. Uh, 
I'm not 100, but I, I do think that's an error. Um, it, it's going to be picked up somewhere by the rate payers and then, but it's stable power. I think that's the attractive part. Uh, and then we're working, there was just an article on the Wall Street Journal this week about the Palisades plant in Michigan. I don't know if you saw this, but uh, they, they were scheduled to decommission. The company that bought them to decommission the plant was approached by Michigan is like, hey, do you think you could actually run this plant? And so in the Inflation Reduction Act infrastructure bill, there's all these this money for nuclear power just for base load. And so there's like a, a plan in place to now bring that plant back online and there's like two billion dollars being invested. But that's a lot less than 14. Exactly. Right. <laughs> so if you already have the infrastructure there to build it out, Two billion is a lot cheaper than fourteen, which is like a new aircraft carrier. So, a but, new aircraft carrier is fourteen. Yeah, I think the newest one with all the cost overruns. I think it was initially supposed to be around ten billion, but when they designed it's or, a mere four billion dollar overrun, <laughs> <laughs> at least. I mean, that's official. <laughs> Last time I checked, which is a while ago, but they when they I know this is a big tangent, but when they what I read was when they were building or. They were bidding the project. They were bidding on systems that hadn't even been designed. They were one of a kind, like the catapult How do you launch. That? <laughs> I guess you, yeah, I guess you're under. Yeah, you, you, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so, like the the launch system has always been the steam catapults, and now it's a linear rail. Oh, that's pretty cool. So it's a linear motor, right? That's wild. But it never been done. So you're trying to do this on a ship with. If, Which means that you need to do R and D on land first. You're basically building a rail gun that doesn't actually have a projectile. That egg, that's really cool. I, I don't know how they did it, <laughs> but there, there was several of these things where it's like the next generation of the basically the power plant. I, I'm pretty sure they had a next generation of of that. So um, all this going back to the the merchant vessel, you don't. They don't have nuclear power. <laughs> Unless it's the Savannah. <laughs> right, which has, I think, been decommissioned in the scrap. Now, there are some nuclear icebreakers that the Russians have, but that's all. Yeah, that's, we don't so is do it that. just a different set of regulations, I guess, around So those? it's just way too expensive. I mean, with the, yeah, the, the life cycle of a ship uh, might be 20, 30 years. Because of corrosion. And, because, yeah, just yeah. like your car. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> right? It's <laughs> yeah. cheaper. It's cheaper to buy a new one. It's than to fresh. Keep an old piece of garbage running after it's, it's been on the road for 30 years. Yeah, I mean, they build these things like it's just not easy. I mean, cost of maintenance is so high yep. compared to just we know how to put this thing together with all new stuff and then away it goes. Yeah, and if you're spending 14 million bucks as a reference number, right. you, know, like, you better really see some ROI out of that. You're not going to make that much on a, on a shipping vessel. Well, the, the exception is with Jones Trade. Ships? Are you familiar with that? I am not. What's okay, this? so so the Jones Act was meant to protect U.S. shipping and provide. I mean, this is my interpretation that in order to maintain a base of U.S. capability for shipbuilding, we're protecting our maritime trade within, like, between U.S. ports. So that, but that also includes between, say, California, Oregon, Washington, and Hawaii, Alaska, Guam. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so if it's between two U.S. ports, it has to be on U.S. crewed, U.S. made ships. So those ships are really expensive to make. So the ROI on actually doing the repairs and keeping these going is a lot better than... Just, because it was so expensive to make in the first place. Just, so. Well, also because making ships in the U.S. for when you're competing against China, Japan, some of these other countries that just churn them out because of cost of labor, materials, everything else, environmental regulations, they can just do it and they, they would run us underwater for sure. Um, that's why if you're buying a new ship, you're not, you're not buying the U.S. unless it's, a, <laughs> unless unless it's have a, to, unless it's a naval vessel or it's going to be Jones Act type trade. Yeah. And, and then you sense. build it here. So it, that's why um, you would do a, a refurb versus a, a new ship if it's in that type of... Yeah. Um, so anyway, going back to your original question, the power plants on the ships <laughs> are typically going to be like diesel, so to be diesel, diesel electric, um, like the same engines you'll have on a train. They'll cool. be on, on like all the Great Lakes ships typically have like these medium speed diesel engines. And uh, they also be combined with a generator 
All the cruise ships are usually like those medium speed diesels and then they're diesel electric drives. So the drives are, they, are actually electric. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. So yeah. they're, they're running a generator and then there's electric motor running that. Yeah. They, this was coming out when I was like graduating, which is like 20 some years ago. Uh, they, they actually have the propeller and the motor are its own hinged pod under the ship. Oh, that's cool. So you have 360 degree uh, capability to move the propulsion. So for maneuvering, it's really good. That's but it's, pretty awesome. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure it's... Titanic probably wouldn't have hit that iceberg if it had that. <laughs> I mean, maybe if they had radar, they wouldn't have. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, you were saying, like, that's what goes on in the ship. The power plant, steam turbines, that's the main thing. Also, the gas turbines is the big thing now. Um, but it's rotating equipment, and you're making power with a generator instead of a... Uh, propeller shaft you're driving. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Robotics. If you're in the market for elite field robotics expertise, please consider hiring SKA Robotics. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Robotics can be found at skarobotics.com. So where does the robotic stuff come in? Um, oh, okay. Uh, uh, for people listening, I yeah, talk about this. This, thing this we, is why we do the robotics part. Yeah. So there's for what we were, the project we worked on, which is a robotic crawler, we have different versions of those. Uh, and inside the generator, you have the generator rotor that's spinning inside the stator. To disassemble that to do an inspection is a very costly evolution. So it's, it's time involved, it's heavy weight, and you're, you're into several shifts of work during a maintenance cycle. So if you can avoid that and do the same inspection with a robot, now you've added value to the customer. They can get back online. They can have the same assurances about the condition of their machine. And you kind of, it's like not, you're buying an option. Like, well, if I can inspect first, if I have a problem, then I'll disassemble and take care of it. But if not, hey, now I've gained three days or whatever it is on my schedule, and I'm back up and running. Well, and that's an inspection robot, but didn't, right. I mean, we worked on a maintenance robot, right? So it's, that, it's maintenance and inspection. So yeah. ours, the one that we worked on is for a new product we're calling the Fast Wedge, and it's a wedge that is inside the generator to basically hold those generator windings in place. We used to just, they were pressure fit in there. So when you go in, we still had an inspection robot for that. I would check, make sure those wedges were tight, and we give a, a map of, the customer's wedges and say, okay, these are good. These ones we're going to watch. They're good for now. Or, oh no, you need to re-wedge this unit. But this one has a mechanical fastener that actually tightens the wedge into place. So to go in to check that, we go in and we check the torque. And like now you have a real value. That's it. If it's loose, we can, we can t take the torque up to where it needs to be. So hopefully we're like just spot checking. Everything's good. If we find some spots and go back and check them more and so we just did the first units. The first big one we did was last fall. We've got several in the pipeline. We're doing one now <clears throat> that'll be going in. Uh, we're like completely new unit. We'll be going in uh, at, at one of our customer sites. Uh, and so we needed to have the capability to make sure we could go in and do this. So the, so, the generator is rolling out that that was designed to go to. This mm. is why you needed the robot. Yeah, it's for an existing unit, but they're doing a, what we call a stator swap. So they're going to get a brand new generator. It's got a new frame, new coil, new core, new windings, and that'll go in. Oh wow! Mm -hmm. That's got to be some money. Yeah, but I mean, it'll be good for another. Hopefully, they're thinking thirty plus years. That's 20, awesome. 30, like, don't quote me. I'm not warranting their unit, but I'm saying <laughs> ty tip <laughs> typical life of a unit. Now that's. That's if you're maintaining it. That's not like maintenance free. There's still stuff. Yeah, but, but I don't change a lot of my car. The main, it's going to be pretty fucked up after 10,000 miles. But the issue is with these units is over time, you have insulation degradation. So the core of the unit is made up of thousands of these really thin laminations that get pressed together. And so it's just like a coating of insulation. So if that coating breaks down over time, then you get current flowing through there. And then that'll cause hot spots, which would cause degradation and burning and you don't want to burn down your unit. So over time, yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, it, even though it's stationary, you got vibration in the unit and all, all, everything kind of wears out. So yeah, you, I mean, you want, like you can replace the windings, but the core is really, that's the big maintenance item. So we'll do core replacements even in situ in a plant. But if you're a nuclear power plant that's base loaded 
you want the lowest offline time that you can do. So you, they've run the numbers, they know what they're doing. If they can bring in a whole new unit and instead of doing the repair uh, like during that maintenance window, take the old stator off, put the new one on, and then go back together. Now you do all the maintenance for the next unit offline. So that's pretty awesome. So it's like the Shigeo Shingo, you know, like get your tool ready to go while the machine's doing something else and then swap it and do the thing. I guess. I mean, it's kind of like when um, you see Ford versus Ferrari when they do the whole. I watch it yet. Oh. You watch it. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> there's this, there's this <laughs> thing instead of them like changing the brakes individually, they just change the whole lower assembly, like each oh, wheel assembly. Awesome. And then the Ferrari guy's like, you can't do that. And it's like, show me where you can't do that. But like, they realize they can just replace these three bolts or whatever it is. I mean, you're essentially just like, where's the value? And yeah, that it's, makes sense. It's the time. It's not the parts. So, yeah. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So like, yeah, just one option you can do. <laughs> so getting back to what you're saying. And now I just want to watch Ford versus Ferrari. And try <laughs> not to forget that. I mean, it's, I saw it in the theater. It was good. It um, sounds fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, good actors and everything. Good story. So, but yeah, that's basically a lot of the robotics are doing now, though, is the inspection. So, but some of our, um, when it comes to the field service side, we've got regions all over, like Siemens Energy Global Company. In different regions, uh, we do different, do things differently just based on what installed base capacities you have in that region. So, in say region, what we'd say, North America, U.S., Mexico, Canada, the ability to move big components to a server shop is going to be more realistic than, say, if you're in uh, sub-Saharan Africa yeah, or in certain parts of Asia, wherever. So some of our um, groups that do similar things that we do in, say, Germany have developed the capability to do on-site machining and welding with robotic arms. Oh, that's cool. And they they have a value proposition to the customer and a business case to do that, and it makes sense. I think we're getting to that level here with the capabilities, and, and so that's something we're looking at, like, how do we make that make sense here? But the, the problem with How do you doing move so a stator that's that large? Sorry, I didn't mean to... <laughs> <laughs> you're going back to the stator okay, thing fair enough but we'll come back to it. <laughs> no it's fine so it's all on rail so oh, in our okay, charlotte factory cool. they that's where they're building the generators um i was just there this week and it's it's quite i mean imagine assembly line for power plant generators 20 foot long 12 foot diameter or something like oh that. Yeah, yeah just yeah they're all different sizes but like say right now the main thing is if you're going to build a new power plant you'll build a combined cycle unit so that's typically two gas turbines and one steam turbine that's running off the the steam is being generated with the exhaust gas of the gas turbine oh that's slick oh it is so we our newest um gas turbine there's there's one in england and i i, I don't want to misquote it but they set a new efficiency record it's over 60 percent efficiency for thermal efficiency for the whole plant which is like Incredible when you think about a coal fire plant is like 30 some percent thermal efficiency wow. of how much energy you're getting out of the beach, but you have really cheap fuel. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you don't count in the negative externalities, you put a <laughs> price tag on that, right? <laughs> so if you're just taking it out and burning and it, 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 it's pretty cheap. But then again, yeah, if you're not it's having to pay, waste. if you're not having to pay for the, you know, your air pollution or what, whatever the downstream negative side effects are. You know that then it looks really valuable. You start adding all that up and adding scrubbers on, and it kills your efficiency. But maybe if you can get really cheap coal, it's still okay. That that's kind of like where utilities, if they already own the power plants, like well, we got this fixed asset. I mean, sitting there, may as well run it. Yeah, but then again, it goes back to like if they already have the permitting and all that stuff. I mean, I'm I'm not in that side of the business, but I would imagine that's a big deal if you're going to have to build a new plant. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, just trying to build or commission, I guess, like a machine shop from experience is <laughs> a ton of work. So. Yeah, anything, the complexity is. I mean, just from a permitting perspective, I mean, like oh. talking to the right officials in the right order. And just building your own house. On transformers. Yeah. <laughs> just doing a home, home maintenance project or home addition or whatever. Yeah. You need all the permits. Yeah. So. 
So you're talking about some of the stuff that Germans are up to with uh, yeah. welding in, in situ, I guess, is that the word? Well, we do that too, but they're, yeah. they've got a... Um, but robotic welding in situ. Yeah, I, and uh, it really just depends on the component and what you need to do. But it, the, just the mixing of different alloys. So imagine additive manufacturing, you're doing that in a cell, and just laser welding, and you can mix your different powders and stuff. And um, if we can do that in situ to get the right thing, because some stuff that we've put out is... Um, like cast iron casings like are great because you can for manufacturing you can get this stuff put out quickly but then from a maintenance perspective you you can't weld on it if you have that ah, <laughs> you get machine it but then so like we've done things in the past we've put in metal inserts to to recreate something but it's not like steel where you're like oh i messed that up i'm gonna re-weld it and machine it. yeah that makes sense yeah so um but yeah, it they've they've done some pretty neat stuff. Uh, it's just, but like I said, it's it depends on what your your market is and what you need to do. Uh, a lot of times we can do most of what we need to with with the tools that we have. But then also, uh, if it's really complex, we can bring it into the like our Charlotte facility has really high tech welding and and a lot of things that we can do these repairs in a much more controlled environment. That, if you're doing things on a job site, the number of factors that are out of your control adds complexity into the project. Yeah, that makes sense. Especially when you're talking yeah. about machining in like thousand, less than a thousandth of like half a thousandth of an inch and you need to get this surface finish extremely smooth. And you've got to do that in the field somehow? Some, Yeah, I mean, sometimes we'll do like bearing journal refurbishment and we can do grinder setup and polishing operations. You can get there, but that's where like you, you have really good people that know what they're doing and have done this before and and but yeah that's that's the value there like you've got really good experienced people yeah that's awesome i mean it almost sounds like a surgery in a way where you're just trying to like you've got this expensive <laughs> asset that you can't screw up and yeah you know, uh, you one shot at this and well that, that's you know, the thing. not ideal conditions and you gotta maybe like fixture magnetically off i don't know how you can attach a grinder to a generator but well like, i would imagine something like that it's on the rotor but like i always joked with one of the other guys i work with when it comes to the machining welding it's like hey yeah if you mess up something with machining most of the time you can like okay we messed it up we gotta add material back on and we can remachine it if you mess up something in the generator like if you leave something in the machine like a metal object and it runs and that thing becomes magnetized, and it goes through the machine and just wrecks it. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Brutal. Like, there's no coming back from that. Like, you're talking millions of dollars of damage, and it's happened. So, when one of the things that we do, and uh, it's pretty common. How big of an item does it have to be to do that? It could be of like a bolt. It could be a washer. It could be a screw. It's like a small one. Yeah. Okay. So when we when we're doing work in a generator, we we have. A moment in time we say okay we're locking this thing down so like if everything's stripped out i'm like okay everything's out we've accounted for everything now we set up a, a complete barrier a physical barrier and we have a checkpoint and you have to log everything that's going in and everything that's coming it's exactly out like a surgery it, in a sense i mean it's yeah it's, it's uh industrial surgery yeah but it's not it's not human life unless the machine really wrecks but <laughs> sorry i shouldn't be laughing at that <laughs> no i mean but yeah it, it is i mean it we've we've talked about the crossover between say a surgeon and them making sure nothing's left in the patient right versus nothing's left in the machine that shouldn't be there yeah and yeah because it's costly when you do that yeah it makes a lot of sense we just did a system it's really basic but it's just all it does is stationary camera so that you have a backup. Like, well, did we log everything in? Well, let's check back on that timestamp. Is there, oh, yep. There were five of those that went in and stuff like that. But we also have to check the equipment. Like, okay, you're bringing in this piece that has, this piece of equipment that has multiple fasteners on it, for example. And you know, like when we, we build the machine, we put Loctite on everything yep. and try and seal everything as much as possible. Torch stripe every bolt. <laughs> right. So you want to inspect those before it goes in and then inspect it coming out. Like, you know, did we lose anything? And like, if, if you can't account for something, it shuts the job down until you figured it you out. You have to figure out where it is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody it's that like puts something NASA in the pocket level. could screw over a whole operation for a large amount. Well, that, that, I mean, there is a risk of that. Like, if someone wanted to sabotage heavy equipment, 
you could I was even, even just do thinking absent mindedly, like oh. a Mr. Magoo, like, oh, let's put this here for safekeeping. I forgot. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. I mean, you're talking about hundreds, like hundreds of tons of rotating equipment at 1,800, 3,600 RPM. And if something, I mean, you have, you have very, <laughs> you have to have it perfectly balanced or you have high vibration. Yeah, that makes sense. And then you have things liberating. And now your maintenance interval is really low. Yeah, well, that's, that's where we, we want to, um, that's, that's a risk for the customers. Like they do not want this asset to, to, I mean, if they fail, it's, it's high stakes, right? So, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and there was a plant last year that we did maintenance on that, that did have a vibration issue. They had a blade on one of their low pressure terms. I'm pretty sure this is what happened. That liberated. As soon as you have something fly off, now you have major imbalance. So then major vibration, and if you lose your lubricating oil or you like lose a bearing, for example, now you're spinning hot there. Now you got fire. Like, is there a way that you can mitigate that when it's running? Like, do you just have to, is there a way to stop it even with some of these generators? So, so what, what the plants have in their electro hydraulic system, that control the valves, you can have emergency stops. So it shuts off all the, like for a steam turbine, you shut the steam off to the engine for a gas turbine, you shut off your your fuel i mean they put out the you fire just, you just starve it effectively and right but you have all down. that mass that's rotating so it's got to spin down giant flywheel it's going to take forever it, it does so like the, you still have to maintain lubricating oil as it shuts down and then you you maintain it turning for a long time afterwards at a slow speed just because if you don't what happens is like <laughs> the issue probably gets worse well, well no 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 reason. like even just in a normal shutdown all that heat if you leave this mass of steel in one spot while it's still hot, it'll just permanently bow and that. Oh no, <laughs> no. <laughs> right. So, so that's the other risk. If you lose lube oil and you don't keep that engine running, gravity takes over. And now you've had this hot piece of metal. That's now going to have this permanent forever. bow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, it's just scrap that thing. But when yeah, this, so suck. like this wreck, and you've seen other photos of this too. It's like the house of horrors when a machine, but like imagine like an 18 inch diameter steel shaft for one of these machines. And I'm sure you did tens tensile tests back in school, right? Where you take materials like, okay, where's this going to fail at? I, when I did battle bots, like you see <laughs> neck in on bolts all the time. <laughs> yeah. It, so imagine like a shaft like that, basically with the torsional torque, when you have like all that energy has to go somewhere. So like if, if you have a bearing seize, you can bend an 18 inch shaft. It'll just cheer. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's still <laughs> material. Yeah. Okay. And then those things go all over the place. Like you've seen like these wrecks where you have like a coupling that's in a parking lot later or like places it shouldn't be. So it's always like, wow, miracle. Nobody was killed when this thing flew apart. Yeah. But like all that energy is, got to go somewhere right so hopefully you want it to go to a productive purpose but when things go wrong it's it's going somewhere right yeah that makes a lot of sense <laughs> some of the things are definitely going to be different across sites but as a culture that's what you have to strive to be at because you you can't just be like oh yeah well we're used to working this way and then show up and like, they'll just be like, you know you can't work here <laughs> you're not allowed in the well even the industry site. standard you have to be below your incident rate all this is tracked so um, some of that has to do with like injury severity, number of incidents and so on. So if your incident rate is too high, they're like, well, you got to get that down before you can even work in our, at our utility. So they take all that seriously. How do you get your incident rate down? You just have to wait? Well, uh, yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess the more hours you work, it's yeah. all about based on the t total man hours that are under your supervision. So man hours versus incidents. And it, it's a, cal ratio. it's a calculation. Yeah. yeah makes so, sense. Right. So you just got to wait. You're just like, all right, well, waiting <laughs> well six months hopefully you're not just waiting. Hopefully you're yeah. taking proactive. Well, no, no, no. I, I, I get that, but I, I more meant like, you know, if you do take proactive actions and you, you become more safe somehow, I mean, I'm not saying right. you guys, but this hypothetical right. Right. bad actor, you know, it would still take them a while to because they'd have to wait for time to do its job and person hours to outweigh. Yeah, I think you'd have to get really stuff. bad to the point where like, oh, you're not even. But yeah, you have to and prove the track out of record in that time because you know. If you're, well, if you have enough um, workers' safe, comp claims, got, yeah, exactly. You're not insurable anymore. Yeah, I mean that's that's the other thing. It drives up your insurance costs, and I mean, but honestly, like 
the main thing is you, you as a company you don't want to put people in danger for sure and really when like when you're at a power plant that's taken out like my wife whenever <laughs> we've gone to a, a power plant and she was like oh this is this you're going in there it's like that just looks scary i mean have you ever been to um or driven by a refinery like i, I think those at night are probably the most scary did you see that new movie twisters i did not should it, i watch that one Ford versus Ferrari, yes, <laughs> Twisters, no. I mean, you can see it on a plane sometime, but there's, <laughs> there's, a, there's a scene where the Twister hits. Oh, it's, it's, like a, it's, like a, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a sequel to Twister. It, yeah, but it, I think it hits like a refinery that has some power plants there too, so like the gas is like up in the in the tornado, and it's like it's you a see flaming it. twister. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> it's funny because it's not real. Well, yeah, it's, <laughs> that's what makes it funny. Is it's totally infeasible, like, right? Um, <laughs> I don't remember. What, so, but yeah, power plants are, can be intimidating. They're big. It's a lot of pipes hanging around, and so if you if you're not used to seeing, like my wife's like, oh, you're going in there. Like, yeah, that's what we do. <laughs> um, but when they're taken apart, like everything's out of place. You've got, you've got work and maintenance going on all over the place. Uh, you could have hot work over here with sparks flying. And if you don't know what you're doing, you could, you could get injured pretty easily. Like on, cause some real material damage or hurt somebody else. Right. Like. I mean, you got heavy loads flying overhead, the rigging of all that stuff. I mean, you really need competent qualified people working on this stuff and even if they are like highly intelligent you need to really drill in safety culture it sounds like right because, you know which is like one of the things we talk about is questioning attitude like even if you're the newest guy if something doesn't sound right to you speak up and make sure it's settled in your head before you're just like going well this guy said it so i'm gonna go along with it. i like that i think that's how you should be with everything yeah, I mean, in theory, um, but there's been a lot of industry studies of where people don't have good feelings and they're just like, well, this guy knows more than me, so I'm going to go along with it. And then something horrible happens and right. somebody could have stopped it. Yeah. There was a, um, I can't remember the name of the book, uh, but it was about that ship that went down. Like, I hate to say Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> But it was, it was like, it was one of the, it was a, it was a cargo ship that was doing runs in the, in the Caribbean. And this captain was like, now nah, we're going to stay on schedule. We're going to, we're going to go through the storm. And everyone's like, yeah, I don't know. It's just like, it looks like a pretty it? bad storm. Dude. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and they're in an old, like, there's just a series of things that happen and you're, you knowing what's going to happen in this book. It's like, oh, um, but it, yeah, spoiler alert, the ship goes down. <laughs> Fair no enough. no survivors it's not um but yeah it, it, they they're reading there's like a data recorder on the ship and they're the book's giving you the dialogue and they're telling you like the the so they were able to recover that after yeah the, that's pretty interesting yeah and i can't remember if there's a um yeah i think they had to go and get it with a remote operated vehicle or it was on like it released or somehow um but they recovered it so they had the logs and it's just so eerie because you know what's going to happen and you're here in the dialogue. And so the, the third mate who's young uh, and, and you, you, there's a lot going on behind the scenes in the book too, power dynamics and so on. But she's bringing up issues like, oh, uh, I, I don't know if this is good. Like questioning that, but like not in a forceful way. And it's like, oh my gosh, you have like, less than a day to live or hours to live here. And, and this isn't going to end well. Yeah. And if, why don't people listen to her? She seems right. to be. Yeah. And one of the ones sense. that we uh, always did in our training was there was a, there was a flight, I think it was at LaGuardia, but there was, um, I can't remember the airlines, but it was same similar power dynamic. Like a, the co-pilot was a lot younger than the pilot. Didn't think things were right. And, but didn't like you hear the, the cockpit recorder and then it's like, oh my gosh, he just, he knew what was going on, but he just felt like he couldn't like, oh, Speak well maybe, up. maybe there's something I don't know, but like it's a, it's, we call that an error trap and error I feel a trap. Yeah. Interesting. It, so that's one of the things we say like, okay, you need to, if you, anybody can call a stop to work. If you, if you see something that's not right, just because, Hey, it's better you stop and we have and it's a like, work oh, stop. Actually, what about this other thing? Oh, my bad. You yeah. Just keep going. Then you didn't stop and it's catastrophic. Right. Like, especially like, oh, I see something that doesn't look like 
no one else yeah how how often is it like no no one else did see that like you only could have seen that so yeah you never hear about all well, the stuff it's also that confusion of responsibility thing where i think mm-hmm. if everybody thinks someone else is going to deal with it then nobody <laughs> deals with it right like yeah this, this psychology um book i read i think it was uh like influenced the psychology of persuasion a while ago okay There's this point where the guy talks about like if you're ever having a heart attack, you should single someone like in a crowd. Oh, you yeah. Should single one person out and say, you, you. Yeah. You know, like I'm having a heart attack. Please call 911. Like, R- right. Jack, you in particular. They teach that in like the first aid, first responder. Like, okay. You go get help. And then you can then go to work on the patient or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Makes a lot of sense. I mean, especially in those situations, you need to have clear lines. I even try to do that when I send an email now. Like, if it's a group email, I try to call out one person to like, do the thing. Yeah, it's just really hard to stay consistent. But, yeah, we, we had that issue a while ago. Just like we have this, you don't know if you use Microsoft Planner, but. It, uh, it, more of a Google guy. Or but, I'm yeah. sure they have a similar product. But, like, I'm sure you have all these tasks. and But, like, oh, well, this person's on that. And he's, like, he's got a little bit of it. And we're, like. Well, if everybody's got part of it, then nobody's responsible. Like, this isn't working. Oh, yeah. No, I worked one place where, you know, there was this idea that we were all going to be responsible to clean the bathrooms and we weren't going to hire a janitor. <laughs> yeah, you, can, you, can, you already know the ending. It's like that ship. Is it, you know, is, it, like, yeah. is it like, it, it almost sounds like if you have roommates, like, okay, we're all resp- like, no. no it's like, that bathroom's just not getting clean. Right. It's going to be disgusting by the end of a week. No, it's like whoever cares the most is going to do it. Yeah, or and then that, be pissed yeah. off at the other people that they're still Slobs. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> He's like, who's the lowest common denominator? Yeah. yeah. So I'm taking out the trash as a director. <laughs> we, we could get into There's a lot of philosophy. way to do this. <laughs> we get into a lot of philosophy about economic systems with that whole yeah. line you're going down. Yeah. <laughs> who's the most motivated? Oh, he's going to do it. Like group projects. Oh, I'll do the cover page. Like, <laughs> I'll make sure the font's right. At the end. <laughs> yeah. I'll do the table of contents. Yeah. Okay. No, please don't do anything else. Yeah. <laughs> we all have those guys. I'll do the picture on the cover. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, perfect. <laughs> perfect. Okay. Can, but let's put that picture in the back, actually, so yeah. people can really use it as an appendix. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what are some of the other things you've seen? So there's a story you started telling me about like, oh. a nuke plant coming up. Oh, to so it. field service, yeah. there's like a whole. I think that was one of the big changes uh, going from field service where you're working on a job site. I'm sure it's like a lot of other construction type trades. Like job site is totally different than working in an office where people have a normal schedule. And like back before it was like, oh, we have business casual and you better have like, there's no jeans. Everything's like way lax now. Um, at least in our office. I don't know about the other offices. So <laughs> I try to be pretty lax. No, no, I'm saying I'm <laughs> in, our, in, our, in our company, like you, every office is going to have its own dynamic a- anyway. Uh, but like the things that we would probably get away with at the time in the field, just pranking type things were pretty good. Uh, so like when I tell my wife this stuff, when we were first dating, she's like, that sounds horrible. You're doing this stuff to people? <laughs> These are your coworkers? I'm like, well, yeah. But then, I mean, also coming out of an academy is like, there's there's definitely some of that that's going on there too. Uh, we had bare knuckle boxing at night at my boarding school. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure we have emotional scars and trauma. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> there's, uh, I'm trying to think. One, one of the things we did... Um, yeah, just pranks. One of the things we did, <laughs> he had a, one of the guys I worked with had a, one of his original IDs from when he started working with Westinghouse. And just like the way, this was like the 80s. And he had, I think he was had like transition glasses. So they looked a little darker, um, bigger mustache, you know. And he looked like, I think it might, just might have been the coloring of the photo over time, but he had like more of an olive complexion in this photo. So this is like going on, like I'm dating myself, but like during the Iraq war and like Saddam and his sons and stuff, like we're looking for him. And we just like made up this wanted poster. It was like third son of Saddam found <laughs> living in the U.S. And it was just like the guy's name underneath. <laughs> it was, it was back and forth, you know. It almost sounds more like a newspaper article. Oh, right. <laughs> like, yeah. But it was just like, I mean, you know, it never left the office, but. Yeah, that's funny. Right. So. Um, but yeah, the story we were talking about was like, 
we had the security guard at one of the plants and he had the biggest comb over haircut and and he wasn't he wasn't an intimidating physically physically intimidating security guard uh needless to say like he doesn't well it doesn't look like he spent a lot of time in the gym and uh so i gave him the nickname of captain comb over because <laughs> he took his job really seriously which was good but it was hard That's, it was hard trait. I mean, it was hard for us to take him seriously so that he would be out inspecting these vehicles uh in this this plants right by lake michigan and the wind would be coming off the lake so he'd be out there with the mirror and then his hair would just like stand straight up on the side of his head as he had it coming over um, so, but this is back when I actually had hair. So, uh, it's not so funny it, anymore, it was, is it? Zach? Well, I, <laughs> I, as I was thinning and like my, you know, I have some family history of this. I'm like, even my, my father doesn't have full head of hair or anything. So one of my uncles, he's British. He told me, he, this is the great thing. He's like, the cover up is always worse than the crime. Oh, for right. sure. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> And in yeah. this case, it was 100% sure. My, my dad's got a full head of hair. My grandfather had a full head of hair. On I your just, mom's side? On, on, my, um, on my dad's side. Mm. On my mom's side, I never met my grandfather. Oh, okay. And um, my, her brother does, is bald. So I think it was my grandmother's genes yeah. and like my mom's genes. That whole thing yeah. about you inherit your hair from your mom's side, totally not true on my case. Like my dad's like, and his brother, no hair. Um, his dad was bald. My brother and I, same haircut, you know. So my brother's got a full head of hair. Oh, yeah. yeah, I think I just, I think I just He's struck adopted. out of the genetic lottery in that way. Maybe you're just really stressed out for a time too, you know. Oh, that's certainly the case. <laughs> yeah. I mean, right. I think I wear it well, though. I, I mean, you, what are you gonna do? Laugh. I mean, it. it is what it is, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah, mean, exactly. there, there's a Telly Savalas quote that I, I remember is like, "God made a few good heads; the rest he covered with hair." So just remember like that, that one, yeah. God made a few good heads; the rest he covered with hair. Yeah, I mean, and you, know, you could act like Telly Savalas. That's pretty good too. Wait, who is Telly Savalas? So That's embarrassing. Yeah, no, it's fine. Um, you have to understand, like my childhood was shaped by my parents bringing home all the black and white videos from the library. So, like, I have this film repertoire of '30s, '40s, '50s movies that probably most kids that were my age would never have seen. So like Humphrey Bogart, James Cagney, like all these actors. Really like W.C. Fields. Like I'm a, I'm a huge fan of W.C. Okay. Fields. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, so Telly, so <laughs> Telly Savalas played the TV detective Kojak in the 70s. Did you ever see that? Scene? I have not seen it yet. Oh, Should I watch it? I mean, it's worth it for a few. He also played in like some action movies like Kelly's Heroes with uh, Donald I've heard Sutherland. Good about that. Oh, it's a cult classic. So, and, and um. Yeah, Donald Sutherland. I've got a whole list of stuff i got to watch. Ford for, versus Ferrari, Kelly <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can quote that movie all the time. And then, uh, yeah, he's in a few others. So Kojak, he's the, the bald. Like, his thing was he was bald. And in, in Kojak, he was a New York detective. But the best part about this show was they drove around in these huge 70s big boat cars. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. I think everyone did in the same <laughs> like, unless they're European. If you watch it now, it's <laughs> like, yo, you couldn't put that on TV now. It's like all yeah. these terrible things. But uh so it would be on at like really late at night when I was growing up and like dating myself again, we would have the the VCR record it for us and we could watch it after school <laughs> we it's came funny, home. But I think they couldn't say the word pregnant in I Love Lucy. Like there's so much stuff. Oh really? You, you, they said no, I'm just thinking of like now, but it's the other way around. Like some of the crime stereotypes and things like that and like cops beating people up all the time. Like I yeah. mean yeah. For sure. Like yeah. yeah. But it I mean just just the the acting of him was pretty good. So it, you should definitely watch a couple episodes. Yeah, I'm gonna check <laughs> just it out. You, just YouTube it. <laughs> It's um. What's the name of the show again? Kojak. Kojak. Yeah. Kojak. Kojak. Yeah. K O J A K. I think. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Just a little plug for Telly in here. The famous bald men of film history. You get. I mean, losing Yul, my hair. Yul Brenner. Yul Brenner. His uh. Like so Moses and the Ten Commandments. I gotta watch that now too. You don't have to watch the Ten Commandments, uh, but good. so um, what else was he in? Uh, The King and I was his big one. And then he was uh, the first. Um, what's is it? Wild. I did see the King and I when I was a kid. Okay. Was, yeah, that was, that was. But West Westworld, the first one, 
before the HBO thing. I did watch the first Westworld. I'm not. You did? Yeah. Okay, so like the the guy I watched the it bald after the count. HBO one because I wanted. Oh, to see, okay. Uh, so Yul Brenner is the the guy, and then he cool. was famous for making anti smoking ads. In the last part of his life, like, don't be like me. <laughs> oh, with like the. <laughs> I don't remember or... if he had that or not, but yeah, yeah. famous bald man. Famous bald man. Yeah. Yeah. Now I remember I, I, when I lost my hair, uh, I was, I was a student and my hairdresser didn't tell me about it cause he was getting 35 bucks a month out of me. <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah, it was, um, maybe was he just friends were just like, dude, what are you doing? Like, yeah. why are you spiking up your hair when yeah. you're missing a giant chunk of it in the back? Yeah. And I'm like, I'm not missing hair. Am I? <laughs> <laughs> like, Do you dude. own a mirror? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I'm like, well, it's, yeah, it's all the way back there. Yeah. Well, I was just getting it cut shorter and shorter and then, I started doing it myself and then my wife was doing it and then she didn't put that the spacer on and then she's like, Oh, I'm like, well, I'm going with it now. Like I can't just have like part of my hair buzz that cor- short. And then I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to do this from now on. But I haven't yeah. gone all the way like bicking. Yet, so. I, I, I tried it. I look like a skinhead when I do it. it does, yeah. I, you know, I probably get away with it cause I'm Jewish, but like, I'm <laughs> not even gonna, you know, yeah. I go down that road. <laughs> right. So it's, it's whatever um, you're comfortable with. Yeah. I find a number two is a good length for mm. me. Uh, I got a trimmer like 10 years ago and right. I've not paid for a haircut since. It's yeah. The best. This is how you save money kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if you're not bald, you should also do it cause it'll make us look less weird. Right. I mean <laughs> so. like Jason Statham, Jason Statham, Statham. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That yeah. Would, yeah that, he, he's got it. He makes you feel better about it. Right. I'm like, I look just like him. Right. <laughs> yeah. Vin Diesel. Yeah. Well, I didn't. I didn't bring him. So yeah. <laughs> I think. I think he actually channels Telly Savalas. Oh, does he? I mean, if I was gonna say like he's he inherited that typecast character to some yeah. degree. Not as good. Not as. I kind of want to watch the Telly Savalas stuff. Though. Right. But I. I feel like there's a vibe there. It's like, yeah. oh, we need this bald guy. Is kind of big. Like, oh, hey. You're going to fill that role for the next 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I guess this is a great paycheck. <laughs> right, right, okay. Beats being a bouncer. Yeah. Was that what he was doing before? <laughs> I don't remember. I'm not an expert on. Yeah. I guess if you're a so. large. <laughs> <laughs> right. You have a real deep voice. Man. You got a deep voice. Yeah. Uh, is um, there anything you want to plug on the way out the door? Uh, I mean, if, if you're a, a utility and you need to do service, like, hey, we can come do that. Awesome. For you on your power plant. Yeah. Sweet. Well, hey, thanks for coming on, buddy. All right. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us today. If you've made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Kraus is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Kraus is sponsored by SKA Robotics. If you're in the market for elite field robotics expertise, please consider hiring SKA Robotics. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Robotics can be found at skarobotics.com. Thanks again and see you on the next one.